A word about Bill Perry, uh, in whose memory, uh, the prison governor in whose memory we meet today. Um, uh, we met a couple of friends uh, who uh, were with me when I worked uh, for a time in Long Latin in the mid-1990s. Uh, Bill Perry opened Long Latin in, I think, 1971. And I felt there, uh, and uh, I, I, I checked with Martin Lomas, uh, the deputy chief inspector of prisons, about this, who was also there at that time, that, 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 that the, the, many of the um, aspects of the culture of Long Latin uh, reflected the values of Bill Perry, and in particular, the uh, value placed on speaking and talking to prisoners and, and interacting with prisoners. Uh, I, I'd never seen, even since the, uh, a prison with... Uh, first name terms uh, on such a wide, uh, such a wide range of prisons and staff uh, uh, automatically using first name terms, and although I'm sure it was true that Long Latin until the sort of the uh, very early 1990s lost its way along with so many of our high security prisons, um, the fact that Bill Perry's uh, uh, um, uh, sort of the inheritance from Bill Perry was still there, and I think. Uh, by all accounts, is still there today as a great tribute to this, to that very humane and visionary prison governor. And uh, um, it, I think it's it, it, it's it, it's right for us to reflect those of us who've got the privilege of working in prisons, um, which I, I, I just I, I count myself enormously lucky to work in prisons. It's um, it's an enormous privilege. Um, uh, I have to realise that. Uh, it's not all about systems, it's about values. And the day that we um, think we've done our job when we've successfully implemented fair and sustainable will be a bad day. Uh, we ha this is a, an intensely value-driven occupation, and I think Bill Perry said that. I think being in charge of a prison, uh, you see how I go off the subject, uh, uh, being in charge of a prison is like being on a down escalator. You have to walk very fast to stay in the same place and to make progress you've got to run, run very hard and, um, and I think you, know, you need values to do that. A brief history lesson, 19th century, let's go back to the 19th century, 1840s to 1870s, the big technological revolution there was, uh, the, uh, was railways and railways transformed, and it's astonishing when you think about it, transformed uh, Great Britain in, uh, in 30 years, uh, uh, you know, just transformed, you only have to read uh, 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 Victorian fiction to realise the, 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 the transformation that, that took place. And that led to greater mobility, people moving about much more, and, uh, and a breakdown of what we describe now as localism. And, uh, and, and it changed the way that people viewed the world. And, and in particular in crime and justice, it had been absolutely taken for granted since Anglo-Saxon times right, that crime was the responsibility of the locality. And the response to crime was the, was, was the community's response. Now, I admit it was a touch on the draconian side at times. But nevertheless, I cling to the idea that, that, uh, that, that, that local government uh, was taken as being responsible for crime. But as time went on and as the railways transformed uh, communities, the view emerged that maybe local government couldn't really afford that anymore. And also, there was a shift in what people thought. They thought that if, if these criminals could move around and could get a train, then crime became a national problem. And indeed, if some parts of uh, the, 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 some prisons or some courts in some parts of the country were less, less uh, fierce, less strong, then, um, then criminals would migrate to, uh, to that area. That's as wrong. Uh, that was, uh, uh, that's as wrong today as it was then. Um, as we know, um, uh, uh, people in marginalised communities just don't go anywhere. Um, crime uh, uh, is a, uh, a, a defiantly local phenomenon. Volume crime, which I was explaining in a moment, is a defiantly um, uh, 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 local problem. And, uh, and all this came together in the 1870s, and, uh, and the view was that, 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 money, that there should be relief for local councils, and, uh, and the central government should take on more expenditure, and Duquesne came to the rescue. He put forward a clinching argument that if, if you nationalised local prisons, as we now call them local prisons, so houses of correction and county jails, if you nationalised them, 
then, uh, then uh, you could save a lot of money because you could close half of them, where well, we've heard that before, you can close these prisons and save some money, close half of them, literally half of them, and, uh, and then uh, refurbish the ones you had left and uh, something for nothing. Fantastic. Uh, unfortunately, uh, what we will now describe as the business case uh, was completely fallacious. And a very strong-willed guy, very impressive man, uh, but, but, but completely fallacious in his argument. Um, weird things happened. Um, he thought, and who would have thought this, that, uh, that prison industries could be productive? Amazing, isn't it? I mean, who would say such a thing? Uh, I mean, we'd never think that today. So long as it is a free service. So there is no um, uh, pressure to resolve the drivers of crime and antisocial behaviour which exist out there in the community. Because you can just dump people in the prison and then wait for them to go back. Standing outside the prison waiting for a taxi uh, to take me to uh, a, a, um, I think it's local criminal justice board meeting. And uh, taxi driver, there's some too much detail here, but it was in the toilet. So I thought, well, I'll go and get my mobile phone out of my car and come back. And, uh, but just then, we were doing the time expired discharges in, from uh, the prison. And uh, the, the, sort of not for discharged prisoners from a prison to have the dignity of going out through a pedestrian entrance. They go out through the vehicle entrance. The vehicle entrance opens and uh, these young chaps uh, walk out. We, we discharge 2,500 people a year into the community. Just walk out to Perry Road. And, uh, and uh, there was some sort of some families and, and, this, and a couple of lads were standing in the car park and uh, this one young man went up to these lads and there was hugging and fist bumping and cheering and so on. And they went, they crossed Perry Road and started walking along in the direction which I had to go to my car. So I ran along the c pavement to, uh, to catch them up and I said, excuse me, and uh, the ex-prisoner sort of jumped back I said, you CID? <laughs> <laughs> I introduced myself, we shook hands. I, uh, he'd been in the prison uh, ten weeks. And uh, I, I introduced myself and we talked a bit and uh, I didn't ask him what he'd done. But, uh, but I did ask him what he was going to do that day. And uh, uh, I decided to adopt the median path from the rest of this one, which is he was, uh, was going to have sex, he was going to, uh, he was going to buy cocaine, uh, he was going to get drunk. Um, uh, I'd given him uh, £46, pounds, uh, uh, a discharge grant, to uh, facilitate <laughs> some of those activities. <laughs> and um, so I kept sort of standing in front of <laughs> as they were walking along. Uh, I don't know his two mates, and I thought I was absolutely and so pretty, they, uh, Looking back at it, I realised they might have called the police at this point, that would have been, <laughs> would have been really great. And, uh, but I said, well, I, I said well, what about a job? And his eyes, I, his eyes met mine. And, uh, and as I recall it, and as I talk about it, it was a look of incomprehension. It's a type of fiction called alternative history. Uh, you may have read some of this, you know, uh, Stephen Fry had a really good one a few years ago in 1998 called uh, Making History. It's, Hitler never became, uh, and never, was never born and, and the world was different. It's good fun, but let's do some alternative history of uh, prisons. It's with, say, uh, just in a couple of minutes, the, let's go back to 1876 and imagine an alternative history in which people see sense, local prisons are not nationalised, Local, local authorities uh, maintain uh, the responsibility and uh, by the early 21st century governors of local prisons are answerable to prisons and probation trusts. Um, they have a legal duty to support the objectives of crime and safety partnerships on whose boards they will sit. Local government employees, local prison governors are enthusiastic participants in local criminal justice boards well aware of the need to make high quality contributions to multi-agency public protection, significant players in the local world. Interestingly, their prisons are smaller but more numerous than current uh, prisons than in real history. And since the late 20th century, local authorities have been making a trade-off between spending on prisons 
and spreading in their communities to heal the social drivers of offending and disorder. Just to temper this with a bit of reality, that's my tatty uh, a, a copy of The Spirit Level by Wilkinson and Pickett, uh, essentially arguing that, unequal, that, that, that crime and big prison populations occur in unequal societies and our, our community is becoming less equal. It's because the, 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 the income span is growing and growing and growing and we cannot achieve safe communities against a background of declining uh, 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 equality. If we've got increasing inequality, the whole of our community can be torn apart 